Good morning. Happy Friday. Mid to the weekend. Ooh. Anyway, get me excited by silly things. Um, good to have you here. We're going to continue talking about gases today. Uh, Monday at 1.10, just like no for lab, uh, we're going to go over problem set number four. So bring that along. It'll go over gases, a little bit of IM stuff. Your quiz will be only over gases. Um, so if you're studying this weekend, try to focus on the gas parts because that'll be the important part for the quiz. And it'll be an in-class quiz. You can absolutely bring a sheet of notes, staple it to the back and stuff. Uh, but bring your calculator too. We're back in the calculator world. Uh, you'll turn in the volatile liquid lab that we did on Monday. You'll also turn in the rough draft class presentation paper. And there's essentially three things that are important for that. Uh, number one, two at least type pages. More is great, but at least two. All right, and they could be pretty rough, but two pages just to show that you're thinking about it, working on the format, stuff like that. Uh, you'll need to have one peer-reviewed abstract and citation. Again, more is fine. Uh, use the library's website to find them. It should be pretty chill. And also, there is a cover page for the rough draft. It's in the syllabus and it's online. I can send it to you if you don't have it and stuff. It's no big deal. Those three things, it should be pretty easy. Pretty easy silent, I'm hoping anyway. And then uh, also bring the linear regression crystallography lab. Uh, this is a kind of different kind of lab we'll talk about. Uh, make sure you bring a calculator next week. We're back in the world of calculators. Um, I'll have your midterms grades posted by Sunday. I'll return your midterms to you on Monday. When you turn in quiz four, I'll give you back everything that you turned in this week. Party just keeps on going. Questions on any of this? So we're going to talk now about the density of gases. And this is something a lot of people don't think about initially. We've talked about how like uh, Chem 221, how more dense things go to the bottom, less dense things go to the top. And that's good and pretty easy to see for solids and liquids, but it applies to gases too. Now we're so used, like the other day I was in Fred Meyer's and they had all these balloons for Valentine's Day and all that stuff. So they're filled with helium or whatever. And of course they float like balloons are supposed to. But in reality, you can have balloons that sink, <laughs> all right? It depends on the kind of gas that's inside there. Now around us all the time, and what you're looking at me through, and I'm looking at you through, is air. And air is a combination, like I said on Wednesday, of oxygen, nitrogen, a little water, a little argon, stuff like that. But it has a density. So just like all things that are density related, things that are less dense go to the top, things that are more dense goes to the bottom, all right? So gases are the same way. So these balloons down here all have a density which apparently is greater than air because they're sinking. This one on the other hand, helium and a couple other ones actually floats. There's some pretty interesting things you can do with this, so hang tight here. Bromine vapor is roughly five times more dense than air. It can be poured from one flask to another. Pouring gas is just cool like that. Watch a lot of science fiction. The density of bromine, like that of all gases, is directly proportional to the molecular mass of its molecules in the gas phase. All right, so this tank over here, it even sounds different when we fill it up. So here, listen to this, it sounds different. Heavy, but when you feel this, it, is, it feels heavy too. Just as we rock the stack and forth and get it. Oh, really? So this is like cool water. Oh, yeah. It's got water in it. It's got a And it's just gas. All right, so the same thing you're going to do, but then here's what I want you to do. I want you to excess uh, all your air goes out, and then breathe in, and then I want you to do the intro to the podcast. Ready? Just keep telling our, tell our listeners at home uh, something of importance. Ready? And there we go. He's bringing in the air. He's sucking up some noise. Right into his lungs. You know, you can do that, but some sort of thing you're really doing, guys. You're not, there's no great behind the scenes or audio transmission. Is that it? It's filling your lungs, isn't it? It's filling your lungs. Yeah. 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 Okay, now breathe in and then push it back out again. You're going to have to do that a couple times because that's your gas. Yeah, one more. Okay. There it is. Hello, y'all. Yeah, I'm in your bag. Thank <laughs> you. 
That looks like magic to me, kind of, and stuff, but it's not. It's just science. Woohoo, no science. Anyway, what you're seeing there are properties of two very heavy gases. So, so the first one was bromine. Bromine's like 160 whatever grams per mole, and you can actually pour it from one container to another. Now, bromine has a brown color, so you can see it actually being poured. Sulfur hexafluoride, on the other hand, has uh, is clear. You can't see it but it's there. And so you can see when that guy was inhaling it, uh, it makes your voice go deep. Just like if you've ever done uh, helium before, just say no kids. But anyway, if you've ever done helium before, it makes your voice kind of go sound like a chipmunk. This is the opposite effect, makes your voice get really low. And what's really cool is they had a lot of sulfur hexafluoride. They were pouring it into that fish tank and they could actually make that little aluminum boat thing like float and then they could pour it on and stuff in order to get it to sink. So it's kind of fun. I tried really hard one year to get a sample of sulfur hexafluoride to try it. And I was really cool, but apparently it's a really bad uh, CFC for the atmosphere and it's very restricted. And I was unable, I was unsuccessful to get it here at Mount Hood. So darn it anyway. So let's talk about why these things are important. Now, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, uh, we're using for lots of different things this week. If you rearrange this a little bit, all right, you divide both sides by V and you divide both sides uh, by RT, you get N over V equals P over RT. And why that's kind of fun is that moles is equal to the grams you have divided by the molar mass of the compound. So if you had, for example, 18 grams of water and you divided it by 18 grams per mole, you would have one mole of the compound. So they're just substituting in for the moles, the mass of the object over the molar mass of the object. And if you rearrange this little beast a little bit, mass over volume is what density is. So what you end up with is density, which is M over V equals PM over RT. And a lot of times people think about this as PM equals DRT. And so sometimes my students call this the evening, because PM, not AM, evening dirt equation. I know, I need a life. But anyway, PM equals DRT is another cool equation, like PV equals NRT. And you can see here directly how the density of the gas is related to the molar mass. So I was making a big deal in the videos about bromine's molar mass and SF6, they were like 150, 160 or so. That molar mass makes the density a lot bigger because molar mass goes up, your density goes up and vice versa. So this is a really cool way to see how the molar mass of a gas is directly affected uh, by the density of the gas. So here's a question you might see. It says, which of these has, which gas has the greatest density, all right? and they're all at the same temperature and they're all at the same pressure, all right? And the way to answer this question is to figure out which one has the highest molar mass. So hydrogen is about two grams per mole, two times 14, 28, 32, 44, good old xenon, by far the heaviest one, all right? So we would predict that xenon, 131 grams per mole, would have the biggest density of all of those there. Any questions? Sweet. Now, in chemistry, there's a lot of relationships that are done at about zero Kelvin and about one atmosphere. So another phenomenon you'll hear about in gases is STP, and that stands for standard temperature and pressure. Now, standard temperature for gases is 273.15 Kelvin, right at zero Celsius and standard pressure is exactly one atmosphere of pressure. And what's kind of interesting about this, and the thing that I use this word most more than anything, is that if you have a mole of gas, and you know what R is, all that kind of jazz, you can actually figure out that a mole of gas is about 22.4 liters of volume at zero Kelvin. All right, thanks for playing. Zero Celsius, there we go. So if you have, if you're ever curious like how much volume about a mole of gas takes, 22.4. If you have half of a mole, roughly 11.2, half of that number, stuff like that. 
it's kind of an interesting thing to throw around. Now again, you have to be at 273 Kelvin, not room temperature. One atmosphere of pressure isn't a big deal, uh, but it is kind of a nice relationship. But also realize that if it talks about STP for gases, it's not 298 Kelvin, which is what all the thermodynamic stuff is, for better or worse. STP for gases is 0 Celsius slash 273 Kelvin. Uh, and atmosphere is no big deal. So here's another kind of question. Oh, Star Trek, yeah. Anyway, sorry, drop that back on. Um, in one of the episodes uh, of the original Star Trek, uh, Khan took over the Enterprise. Yeah, Khan from Star Trek II, if you know about this, but I'm dating myself again. But anyway, they use what's called neural gas to knock all of Khan's supporters out. So we'll say that Spock here used uh, two moles of neural gas to stun all of Khan and all of his people. And if this was STP, what would be the volume of the gas? Well, if one mole is 22, 2.4 and 2 moles was used, 2 times 22.4 would be 44.8. So there's really no reason why I put the Star Trek reference in, but it is Friday. Qu questions? Now, gases as well as solids and liquids are described in chemistry through the KMT, the Kinetic Molecular Theory. And there are some assumptions that are made, and these assumptions will become important as we go through these sections. First of all, if you have gases, we'd assume that they're kind of just running around like crazy, right? There's no interactions between the gases at all. And that's usually a pretty good uh, assumption to have, because gases are pretty independent. Um, the pressure that's exhibited by gases comes from the gases colliding with the walls, all right? So the pressure that we feel all the time around us is from the gases, if you will, like pushing down on us. And that's the origin, they think, of why pressure exists, which is kind of an interesting thought. Now, this one is kind of going to be something we'll talk about more and more. Um, when gases collide with each other, all right, the interactions are assumed to be elastic, which means that there's no like lost friction energy. And that can be a little bit of a problem, but overall it's not a bad assumption for most gases. So we're gonna assume that when gases come together, bam, they bounce off, they don't lose any energy, jazz like that. However, this last one can be problematic. It says that the volume of the molecules is overall pretty negligible. And that's not bad, but we'll see some problems with that. So when chemists think about gases with the KMT, these are some of the assumptions that come down from it. And what's kind of neat is nothing else is that you would now maybe see a rationalization for why pressure exists, but you could do more. Now, in physics, and we're stepping a little bit into physics now, the kinetic energy, the energy of the gases can be described as equal to one half mv squared. And another expression for kinetic energy of gases is this thing right here, three halves rt. And there's some real interesting applications here of terms of gases. And by the way, this r is the other energy r we'll talk about later. We're not gonna calculate things with this, but we will use this set of equations to understand what's happening. So what these equations tell chemists is that if you have the same temperature and you have two gases, they're gonna have the same energy, all right? It can be the Spock's neural gas to helium to SF6, but as long as they're at the same temperature, they're gonna have the same energy. Remember, R is just a number, just a constant. This is a number. So temperature and kinetic energy absolutely play a factor. But if the energy is the same, there's another relationship which is really important. And that's the mass of the gas times the velocity or speed of a gas. And what this says is that if you have two gases at the same temperature, they're gonna have the same energy, but they will not be the same speed, all right? 
So David's going to be someone I'm going to reference a lot today. Sorry, I knew this was what you wanted to hear on a Friday, right? But David is smaller than me. I eat a lot of pizza. <laughs> so David goes, man, Russell, let's go run at the track. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Anyway, David's going to kick my ass, right? Because he's funny. <laughs> he's lighter and stuff like that. It'll be the same temperature and stuff like that, but he's going to go faster, all right? Now, why that's relevant, besides me liking pizza, is that as the mass goes up, if the energy is the same, if the mass goes up, your speed goes down, all right? So heavier things are going to go slower, lighter things are going to go faster. Mass goes up, speed goes down. And I use the idea of the track because I think it's appropriate. The runners, you know, none of them are big heavy people and stuff. They're the football players, whatever. But as mass goes up, the speed goes down. So again, if you're at the same temperature, all your gases are gonna have the same overall energy. But the mass of the, of the gas will play a factor because as the mass gets bigger, your speed gets slower. So helium gas, four grams per mole versus nitrogen gas, 28 grams per mole. Nitrogen is like me, it's got more mass, it's gonna go slower. Helium at four grams per mole is like David, it has less mass, so it's gonna go faster. Gas molecules are in constant motion and frequently collide with one another. Although not all the molecules in a gas sample move at the same speed, the higher the temperature of the gas, the greater the average speed and kinetic energy of the molecules overall. This higher level of energy allows molecules to disperse more readily, which is one reason we smell aromas better when temperatures are higher. PV equals NRT shows you that as temperature starts increasing, the pressure is going to go up. On the other hand, you start having lower temperatures, then your pressure is going to go down. The molecules themselves will be more active at the higher temperature than they will the lower temperature. So they'll have more collisions with each other, they'll collide with the walls more often, all that kind of jazz. And this again just shows that the kinetic energy is proportional to that temperature. You start increasing the temperature, everything starts it's getting more active. On the other hand, it's cold outside. Who wants to come into AC 1303? I understand. I've got to try and jump it up. But anyway, it's harder to do it because it's lower temperature, lower energy. Now, good old Maxwell. You. <laughs> the <bed. laughs> Yeah. No, it's all right. Maxwell did a lot of the frequency, wavelengths, kind of conversions we talked about in Chem 221. Maxwell did a lot of really interesting kind of things, but one of his equations is this one right here. Now, U is the average speed of a gas, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The speed is related to the temperature, and it's inversely related to the molar mass. So Maxwell's equation says that if you want a good speed, you should increase the temperature because they are proportional to each other. On the other hand, as molar mass gets bigger, your speed is going to go down. Now there's lots of square roots. This is the average speed of the thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So there's a lot to it, but Maxwell said that, yeah, speed's going to start going up as your temperature goes up, but if you have heavier gases, they're going to start going down as the molar mass goes up. So this is a more elegant way to say what I was saying about David and the track and stuff like that, so. Cars on highways travel at a variety of speeds. To show the distribution of automobile speeds, we could plot the number of cars moving versus their velocities. Molecules in the gas phase show the same variability of speed. Plots of molecular speed distributions are called Boltzmann plots. So David, you're on my radar this morning, so I apologize in advance. However, I know that David likes cars. He's always posting things about cool cars and stuff and talk to him about it. I don't know anything about it. I don't even know how to drive hardly. But anyway, <laughs> if we're on the freeway, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna assume that uh, David's probably by more like someone that pushes the speed limit a little bit more than I would. So in the picture, there was the freeway, there were some cars going really, really fast, all right? I like to think of myself as a more middle, middle of the road, you know, maybe the speed limit, maybe five 
miles per hour more or something like that, but not going too crazy. On the other hand, there's always the super senior citizens that decide to go their own speed, i.e. really slow. So on a freeway, you have a whole bunch of different speeds, all right? There could be an average of all those cars' speed, absolutely. And why that's relevant is because gases are that way too. The average speed is what chemists usually think about, but in reality, you're gonna have a whole bunch of different speeds. So this is an example of what's called a Boltzmann plot. It shows a variety of speeds, that's what this part is right here, and the number of molecules that are at that speed. And the average speed is where the highest part of the peak is right there. That would be the speed limit, plus or minus a few miles per hour. And then, again, David, I apologize, but I'm gonna say that you're like really into speed. So you'd be over on this side, a faster person driving, <laughs> all right? On the other hand, uh, sometimes when some of my family members drive, I swear to God, they're close to zero as possible. <laughs> anyway, there's a variety of speeds on the freeway. There's a variety of speeds for gases, all right? So at any temperature, you're gonna have this distribution, all right? And that's another really cool thing to think about when it comes to gases. So here's two samples of oxygen, but the temperature is different. So this is oxygen at room temperature, the blue line. This is oxygen at 1,000 degrees Celsius, so quite a bit warmer. You can see that the average, which is the top of the peak, the average has shifted as the temperature goes up, all right? However, at this room temperature, there's some gas molecules even here that are going super, super fast. And even at the super hot temperature, there's still some temperature, some gas molecules going really, really slow. It's a distribution of speeds. It's not just one speed for all gases. Remember, we're dealing with 10 to the 23rd of these crazy things at one time. Yeah. Can you kind of like an equilibrium of different speeds? Yeah, an equilibrium would be a good term. Um, we're gonna talk more about equilibrium in uh, spring in Chem 223, but honestly, that's not a bad way to think about it, Josh. Yeah. Here's four different gases at the same temperature, all right? Oxygen, nitrogen, water, and helium. And here we're seeing that inverse relationship to the molar mass. The lightest gas is helium, four grams per mole roughly. This is the heaviest gas, roughly 32 grams per mole. And again, you can see that the top of the peak is a lot slower for oxygen than it is for the top of the peak of helium. But even heavy oxygen is gonna have some gas molecules that are going pretty fast. And even super light helium is gonna have some gas molecules going really, really slow. So it is a distribution. It gets wider usually as the temperature goes up and there's fun things you can do with that. But I just want you to see that not all gases are gonna be the exact same temperature. Some will be faster, some will be slower. And again, the two ways to think about it are temperature and polar mass. So that being said, there are three gases in this problem, B2H6, O2, and water. This is a solid. Solids don't have gas properties, so we'll ignore that. And so the question is here, uh, what is gonna be the order of increasing velocity? So increasing velocity, the lightest one will go fastest, and the heaviest one will go slowest. Now, oxygen is about 32 grams per mole. The grams per mole molar mass is what we're gonna to use to figure these out. Boron is roughly 10 grams per mole, there's two of them plus six. This is 26 grams per mole. So this will be lighter than oxygen's 32 grams per mole. But water over here is 18 grams per mole. That's the smallest molar mass of any of them. So increasing velocity means the heaviest molar mass first and the lighter molar mass will be the last one. So of these, this is the heaviest one, 32 grams per mole. That will be the slowest. Water has the smallest molar mass, so that will be the fastest of all these gases. So you can see here how it's, a lot of these things are molar mass dependent. So. Questions on that? Gases mix readily, uh, it's usually no problem. We're gonna see with solids and liquids, there's different force things to think about when, gas, when solids and liquids mix. But when gases mix, it's no problem. So diffusion and effusion are two terms that are used with gases. 
Diffusion literally means that two gases are mixing. There'll be some kind of a hole, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, and the gases will mix accordingly. Effusion is when you have a vacuum on one side and there's often a hole, intentional or unintentional, hard to say, but the gases will go through that hole to the other side. Uh, vacuums are hard to maintain because gases and stuff always want to go through the other side. So diffusion is just two gases mixing. Effusion is a vacuum on one side and the gas is sleeping, slipping into the vacuum side. Now, there's some interesting things that happen with diffusion and effusion, and the properties are, are basically the same. First of all, the speed of diffusion and effusion is absolutely proportional to temperature. More energy, more excitement for the gases, they can diffuse or effuse faster that way. But also, because it is related to mass, all right, the lighter gases will go quickly in, and the heavier gases will be harder to go in. So for example, if you have helium versus oxygen, at the same temperature, helium has a smaller molar mass, four grams per mole, versus oxygen, which is 32 grams per mole. So the helium will go in a lot faster usually. Uh, bromine is used in a lot of these pictures because bromine has a color associated with it. So you can see how initially there was bromine inside and then after a while it leaked through, or it looks like it maybe came totally out, and it then effused or diffused depending on what was inside there to the other side. Now this guy named Graham was the first one to think about diffusion and effusion. He studied it and what he basically came down with was an extension to Maxwell's rule in my opinion. But the speed of the first gas is inversely proportional to the molar mass. And what he did is he compared a lot of gases together. So he had A over B. The important part for us here is that the Bs and the molar masses are opposite and the A, rate speed of A and the molar mass are opposite too. So again, we're seeing here a lot how the speed of things inversely related to the molar mass. So David and I go to the track, David kicks my ass, no problem. He has a smaller molar mass, all right? Smaller molar mass, faster. Bigger molar mass, slower. Um, I'll notice the use of rate here. We're gonna start using rate this quarter. Rate is nothing more than a speed. So on a car, and like a highway, that would be miles per hour, kilometers per hour, whatever. In chemistry, it can be things like moles per second, grams per second, molarity per second, stuff like that. It's just like, if you will, a chemistry speed. This is kind of a cool um, little experiment here. This is a true YouTube, <laughs> not the one where you look up cat videos and stuff doing fun things. This is a true YouTube, it looks like a U obviously. And on one side they have ammonia, NH3, and on the other side they have hydrochloric acid. Now both of these can turn into a gas, all right? The HCl has a little bit of a vapor pressure, we'll talk about that in the next side. But anyway, here what's happening is the HCl is on this side and the ammonia is on that side, and they both have gas associated with them. So the question is here, when HCl and NH3 come together, they're gonna make a solid white compound, ammonium chloride. And HCl and NH3 are different molar masses. All right, roughly ammonia is 17 grams per mole, and roughly HCl is 36 grams per mole. So this is a heavier gas and ammonia is a lighter gas. So if all of Maxwell's stuff is correct, we would predict that because HCl is heavier, it's gonna form on the ammon or on the HCl side first because the HCl is gonna be slower getting here and ammonia is gonna go faster. So we predict then, based on molar mass, that ammonia is gonna to go to the other side and we'd see the NH4Cl form closer to the HCl than the ammonia. On the right is HCl gas, and on the left is NH3 gas. Where the two meet, a reaction occurs producing ammonium chloride gas. The reaction occurs primarily on the right because NH3 is lighter and diffuses faster. So again, we can use the idea that as molar mass goes up, the speed goes down. HCl is heavier, it has a bigger molar mass. NH3 is lighter, it has a smaller molar mass. 
smaller things go faster. The NH3 reaches the top and goes over here, so all of the white NH4Cl forms on that side. Okay, finally, the ideal gas law is pretty awesome, all right? There's so many things you can do with it. PV equals NRT. In lab, we saw the uh, uh, GRT over PV for molar mass, and even now today, we've seen PM equals DRT. But in reality, there are some conditions where my beloved ideal gas law doesn't work as well. And it doesn't work as well sometimes because real molecules have volume. They're not just little indistinguishable parts. But even more importantly, is that gases have what's called intermolecular forces, IM. And if you didn't have these intermolecular forces, no gas would ever become a liquid. And one of the assumptions of the gases is that they don't have any interactions between them, but that's not really very true. There are some forces. So if you think about gases, high pressures and low temperatures are generally the places where the ideal gas law breaks down. So Jacob works in a company and he's making some kind of a compound and you need a high pressure of gas you might not want to use the ideal gas law to describe the behavior of your gases. Same thing with low temperatures and stuff. So I'm just showing this up here. We're not going to use it. But the main alternative to the ideal gas law is an equation called the van der Waals equation. And the van der Waals equation is like ideal gas law version 2.0. And it is better a lot of times for different high temperature um, uh, kind of condition or low temperature, high pressure conditions. And this is what the I van der Waal equation is. And again, we're not going to use it, but I just want to, I wanted to you to see it in case you ever do end up using it. It's like PV equals NRT, but the pressure has an added component and the volume has an extra component to it. And these corrections help to compensate for the limitations of the ideal gas law. Believe it or not, van der Waals is used quite a bit in industry. So if you ever do things with gases, you might end up using van der Waals. We'll talk about van der Waals more in the next chapter, too. Um, these are just examples of the constants that are used. There's a little a and a little b. Um, there's really good tables of them. You can calculate these things in the lab. Uh, this is an example I found online one day. Here we've got chlorine. And we've got eight moles of chlorine in a four liter tank at just about room temperature. The ideal gas law would predict you have 49.3 atmospheres, and the van der Waal predicts it's 29.5. And at the time, the authors were like, well, it's a little less than ideal gas law, but it's not quite this low. So use this equation sparingly, but it is used a lot in industry. So if you ever go in and you have to think about van der Waals, You've heard the name, questions, but we won't use it at all. So. All right, so let's get out of the gas laws and stuff, so, and let's start talking a little bit more about those intermolecular forces. Now, intermolecular forces are a real subtle player when it comes to solids, liquids, and gases. And intermolecular forces is a very strange concept. But you can literally think about intermolecular forces as being tiny little hands on the molecules that hold on to other molecules. Uh, gases don't have these little hands communicating with each other, but you bet that solids, liquids, and gases do. Or solids and liquids do, excuse me. Now, intermolecular means between molecules. So these are two organic molecules here. Uh, this is a carbon hydrogen, this is a carbon oxygen, et cetera, bond. They call those intramolecular forces. And the ionic bonds we've talked about and the covalent bonds, those are intramolecular. Intermolecular, again, is between molecules. And a lot of times in diagrams, they'll show up as little dot, dot, dots like this. We're going to talk about what kind of dot, dot, dot intermolecular forces there are. There's a couple of them that exist, and it depends on the kind of nature that you're looking at. But uh, intermolecular forces are subtle players in a lot of stuff in chemistry that people sometimes ignore. <clears throat> now, 
if you have a gas and you cool it down, all right, or as we'll talk about later, you can increase the pressure, you can then turn your gas into a liquid. And if you keep cooling the liquid down, you can turn it into a solid. So again, water as a vapor is H2O, but as you cool it down, what happens is the water molecules then kind of condense and they become a liquid. And if, of course, if you put it in the freezer, it gets even colder and they get even tighter to, to solid ice. So this happens for all compounds. And again, when you're cooling it down from a gas to a liquid or liquid to a solid, you're not changing H2O to HO or something like that. It's still H2O, but it's the relationship between the particles which change. And on the converse, if you heat up a solid, it turns into a liquid. And if you heat the liquid up, it goes to a gas. And so sometimes solids and liquids are referred to as condensed phases, all right? Because they're more condensed than gases, which are totally crazy. But what we're gonna start looking at here, in addition to what a liquid is and what a solid is, we're also gonna talk about how to transition from a gas to a liquid, or how to transition from a solid to a liquid, stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> When you have a gas versus a liquid versus a solid, there are two things to always think about. First of all, the kinetic energy of the particles will definitely be a factor. So if you have a lot of kinetic energy, it's gonna be gases because the gas is like, yeah, I'm out of here. On the other hand, if your kinetic energy is low, then you're gonna start having more attraction between the particles. So believe it or not, water has more attraction to the other molecules of water than in a gas. It flows, you can pour it, all right? You can't really pour gas vapor, all right? It goes all over the place. And of course, in the solid ice, that stays together, very rigid, everything's very rigid. So when you're thinking about solids versus liquids versus gases, a lot of times it comes down to how much energy they have versus the strengths of attraction between the different particles. So in this chapter, we're gonna start talking about the attraction between the molecules, intermolecular. Now, intramolecular has been like the covalent bonds, the ionic bonds, stuff like that, and those are still important. And those are by far more powerful than the intermolecular forces. However, the intermolecular forces are used to explain why some substances vaporize easy or why you can make things into a liquid pretty readily, stuff like that. They're not true chemical bonds, all right? They help us to understand the chemistry, but they aren't true chemistry bonds per se. Um, this is just an example showing the relationship between the kinetic energy, which sometimes is abbreviated E sub K, and the intermolecular attraction. So in the last chapter, gases, all right, gases had no intermolecular forces. In reality, there's a little bit, but it's very, very, very low, all right? They have incredible kinetic energy. So they're moving around, beep bopping and all kinds of stuff around, no problem. On the other hand, when you turn a gas into a liquid, there's usually then less kinetic energy, all right? And so they're more interested in talking to each other, if you will, that's where the intermolecular forces become a little bit stronger. And if you turn a liquid into a solid, then you definitely start chilling out on the kinetic energy because they're more locked in place. Those intermolecular forces are very, very high. So notice here what we're doing. All right, solids are gonna have the strongest intermolecular forces of all, all right? Liquids will be, will be strong, but not as strong as solids. And we're also assuming, basically in this class, that, can, that gases have no intermolecular forces at all. They have a lot of kinetic energy, so they're, they're totally fine. So solids and liquids will have intermolecular forces, but gases won't have any intermolecular forces at all, at least in Chem 222. Now, intermolecular forces will definitely affect your boiling and melting points. Um, there's also things we're gonna talk about in this chapter called vapor pressures and viscosities that's gonna affect. And there's gonna be several of these IM forces we're gonna talk about 
in the companion and online, there's like a flow chart kind of thing I developed, which talks about how to find the intermolecular force. And uh, if you have nothing else to do with your time, don't throw tomatoes at me. The I am forces guide can be helpful because it'll ask you a series of questions to figure out the type of intermolecular force. So let's start talking about these things and see what they're all about. The first intermolecular force we're gonna look at is called the ion dipole force. And when ionic compounds are placed in water, this is the dominant force by far. Now we've talked about, for example, how sodium chloride doesn't melt until it gets to like 800 degrees Celsius. And I think magnesium oxide was like 2200. It was crazy high. However, you put both of those in water and bam, they break up. That's because water has a really strong attraction to ions. And here's like an ionic solid. Water has both a positive and a negative part. Um, water, here's H2O. The oxygen has two lone pairs on it. That's a, gonna be a slightly negative part. On the other hand, this part away from that lone pair by the hydrogens is gonna be slightly positive. That's delta minus delta plus. That means there's partial polar sides. They have a dipole. And that partial negative, partial positive is really good at extracting positives and negatives. So you can see here on the positives, the oxygens are all facing towards the positives. And here with the negatives, the hydrogen, the water part is trying to aim toward it. It like surrounds them and pulls them from the matrix, if you will, of this thing right here. So the ion dipole force is the intermolecular force responsible for having solids dissolve in water. Anything that's polar is going to be a dipole, all right? And in this chapter, every time you hear dipole, think polar. Now an ion is something with a positive or negative charge. So this could be like a sodium plus and a chloride minus, or an ammonium ion and a bromide ion something with positives and negatives. So ion dipole just means something with a charge and something that's polar. When a gas phase sodium ion enters water, it becomes surrounded by water molecules or hydrated. The ion water connection results from ion dipole forces indicated by a dotted line. It is difficult to determine the number of water molecules around a hydrated ion, but six is a good estimate for most cations. This is a pretty strong force. They can actually measure sometimes an enthalpy, a delta H value. The energy, it's a negative number, so you get energy out, exothermic. It's very, very strong. And again, this is why most, a lot of compounds dissolve well in water. Now, not everything does, because sometimes the ionic forces are stronger than water. But if they do, if you see anything that has an ion and something that's polar, ion dipole. The colors of inorganic chemistry that I fell in love with, that made me become an inorganic chemist, I think I was battling about it, it's ion dipole force. <laughs> so really, this should be my favorite force. I don't know if it is or not, but it should be. Um, transition metals I usually have really neat colors when they're placed in water. And these are just a couple of them that are around. Uh, we'll see some of them in lab too. But again, what's happening is the iron, uh, in this place, iron three plus, the iron three plus is surrounded by waters. The water has a negative side, which is the red oxygen side, and they basically surround the ion, iron. So whatever else the ion was with, chloride, nitrate, whatever, is, if you will, pushed to the side, the iron is surrounded, it pulls itself out, and these really neat colors kind of pop in. So it's a pretty strong force. All right, it's able to overcome the ionic forces of these uh, metals, which is pretty neat. Hydrogen chloride molecules are polar. When HCl molecules in the gas phase are cooled, the kinetic energy of the molecules can no longer overcome the dipole-dipole forces between them. The opposite ends of the molecules attract each other and coalesce to form a liquid. Now remembering that every time you see dipole, you should think polar. A dipole-dipole force is when two polar things come together and they start having intermolecular forces. So earlier we saw in that little demo with HCl and ammonium, there was gaseous HCl, all right? And it can be a gas, totally. But what happens if you cool the HCl gas down, 
the HCL starts to interact with other HCL molecules. Now, HCl is polar, all right? Cl loves electrons, it's more electronegative. Hydrogen is less sent to electrons. So we would say that the chloride is slightly negative and the hydrogen is slightly positive. And you can see what happens here. The positive of one side interacts with the negative of the other. So this would be the H plus of this HCl and this would be the chloride of this HCl. These little dashed lines are the intermolecular forces. So this is an example of the dipole-dipole force. We don't have any more ions, no sodium pluses or chlorides. Here it's dipole and dipole, polar thing with another polar thing. And when HCl forms a liquid, which it does, or even a solid if you get it cold enough, the intermolecular forces are dominant. There's some interesting things that the dipole-dipole force does. We have here two gases that are the same molar mass and another two gases with almost the same molar mass. Now, nitrogen and CO, both are 28 grams per mole. And boiling points, all right, are basically about two things. First of all, it's most, a lot of times it's about the molar mass, how big it is. And if you try and throw something in the air, if things are lighter, they're easier to get in the air. So less molar mass is usually easier to boil, more molar mass, harder to boil. But that doesn't apply here because these are the same molar mass. But there is a difference in the boiling point. And what it comes down to is CO is polar. The oxygen pulls a little electrons more towards it, and carbon has less oxygen or electrons around it. So we would say that the oxygen is slightly negative and the carbon is slightly positive. It's polar. So polar things stick to each other a little bit. So that's why it takes four degrees of Celsius more to make CO begin to boil. All right, that stickiness of the polar CO allows it to have a higher boiling point, it takes more energy to make it boil. And you really begin to see it as the fat gases get bigger. Now these are a little bit different. This is a little bit heavier, but again, bromine, bromine and bromine is non-polar. They pull evenly. But ICL, CL pulls more than I does on those electrons. Much more polar and quite a bit heavier, higher boiling point than just the bromine. So things that are polar tend to have higher boiling points than things that are nonpolar if the molar mass is about the same. This subtle little difference here can make a big difference in the boiling point of things. So here's kind of a question uh, you might see. Sorry, I was having a spasm. There we go. This is an example of acetone, all right? You used it in lab uh, on uh, Monday. Acetone, CH3, C double bond O, CH3. This carbon is trigonal planar, all right? It's got a double bond O and two CH3s. Is acetone polar? Anything that's, uh, yeah, yes, anything that has a different central element, everything's not the same, will be polar. And double bond O is certainly different than methyl groups. So this one's going to be polar. So the question is, then, what's the strongest intermolecular force? Well, this doesn't have any ions, so it's not the ion ion. But it's polar, all right? So anything that's polar, you would say dipole, dipole. We'll talk about these other ones in a little bit, maybe on Monday. But if you see something polar, you would say dipole, dipole. If you had sodium plus in water, that would be an example of ion dipole, because then you have something with a charge and something with water. Any questions? All right, now, dipole, dipole is a pretty strong force but there's a way to supercharge your dipole-dipole. And that's in through what's called hydrogen bonding. So here's some examples of what hydrogen bonding's all about. 
Hydrogen, when it's next to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, goes like hyper crazy powerful. <laughs> nice adjectives, I know, but please bear with me, I do watch Star Trek. So imagine your hydrogen here is connected to NO or F, and it comes into contact with another NO or F next to hydrogen. All of a sudden, the attraction goes way off the scale. So dipole-dipole was -dipole strong, but hydrogen bonding is even stronger. But it only happens when your hydrogen is connected to N, O, or F. So here's an example of ammonia with water. Oxygen is connected to a hydrogen. Nitrogen is connected to a hydrogen. This is going to be a time where hydrogen bonding kicks in. You can also have two water molecules together. You can have two ammonia molecules together. You could have hydrofluoric acid, HF, next to one of those, and that would be it. But man, this thing becomes like supercharged dipole dipole. So we'll talk more about H bonding on Monday. Thank you so much for being here. See you on Monday. Have a great day.